So I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer. Thanks for being here. David, you just let me know when we're actually on the air so I can comb my hair. Why are you laughing? Look who's talking. Look who's laughing. This guy's laughing the loudest. I just remember I forgot my comb. <laughs> I didn't even hear David over my dumb joke. David, what did you say? We are live. Okay, are we on the air? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, welcome everybody to our class. This is week number three, Developing a Christian World View. I'm going to open tonight in a word of prayer, if you could pray with me. Father, we thank you for this evening. Most of all, we thank you for who you are. The creator of the universe, as your word says, that you created all things and you created them to exist for you and your glory. We also thank you for being the Savior, and you've made that possible through the only Savior and mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also thank you for your Holy Spirit, who you actually uh, allow to live in those who know you, have been adopted into your family, who believe in the gospel. And his role is be our comforter, our advocate, our teacher. So we pray that we would have teachable and submissive hearts to the Word of God so that we might learn from you this evening. Thank you for the body of Christ, the church, and give us your discernment tonight as we talk through the issues, and we thank you for it and commit it to you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, week number three. To clarify how long will we be going developing a Christian worldview, I was thinking about four to five weeks, so this is week number three. Uh, I was looking at what I still have on the agenda. I was not confident that I could finish everything adequately this week and next week, so we might go a total of five weeks, so next week and then one more after that is the plan at this point. Um, let's do a little review. Gave you a handout. Hopefully you brought that. Uh, with you, developing a Christian worldview. We're going to do a little review. Tonight is going to be, I predict, very interactive. So I would like your input, see what you think. You did a good job last week. We'll do that again. If I call on you spontaneously, just ask you a question. Don't panic. Um, just do... Do your best. You could, we did, that was going on last week. We had people phoning a friend. So that's legit. But I do want to do some review. As we're developing a Christian worldview there at the top, our th one of our theme verses, we have many. One was Lord Jesus himself in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, talking about the two greatest commandments, one of which was love the Lord your God. And then I emphasize just part of it there, love the Lord your God with all your mind. So... God created us in His image as rational beings with intelligence and a mind. And if you're a Christian, your mind, our mind, is a gift from God, and He wants us to be good stewards of it. And He's given us His Word, Scripture, uh, to search His Word for truth and to use our mind in doing that as we live in this world, as we live in this fallen world. Uh, so we talked about how a Christian worldview is primarily about the mind and how we think. That was a part of our definition. It also has to do with our beliefs, what we believe, and what we believe really forms a grid or a prism by which we view and interpret all of reality and make convictions. So we talked about our defin definition of a, what worldview is. Um, we talked about the main categories of a worldview, broke it down into three, theology, anthropology, Cosmology, a lot of big words. Michael, take a shot at a good definition of anthropology. What would you say it is? Remember, anthropology or theology? Either one of those? Anybody? Uh, words that end in L O G Y means it's study the study of. of. So, theology is the study of. God, and then anthropology is the study of humanity, so your doctrine of humanity, human beings. Uh, the Bible has a very distinct view of what uh, humanity is and its origin. So to have a Christian worldview, we've got to have a right theology, 
what we think about God, a right anthropology, what we think about humanity and all those areas, and then also a right cosmology, what we think about the created order. I mean, I'm even saying created, but the universe, ecology, geology, origins of the universe, history, science, and even alien life. We talked about a uh, number of worldviews that have been proposed. There's the popular ones. We concluded that the Bible suggests there are two, really, worldviews, because there's only two categories of people on planet Earth. I mean, there's one big lump sum of category of human beings, and those are sinners, but then in terms of relation to God, you're either saved or you're not saved. So you're either a child of God or a child of Satan. Really, those are the only two categories of humans, and we establish that clearly from Scripture, even Jesus himself. John chapter 8 and other places where he said, you are of either the Father, God, or you're of the devil. And then also in Matthew where he talked about Christians are, or believers are salt and light, unbelievers are darkness. So only two categories, the Apostle Paul and the other apostles talked about only two categories of people. And so we're, we were saying that to have a true biblical Christian worldview, that's how we need to view people. Every human being is made in the image of God, but they currently exist either as an unbeliever or as a believer. That's it. There's no in-between. So that's pretty clear in Scripture, and that helps us in our worldview and how we relate to people, understand people, think about people. Then last week we talked about uh, Roman numeral number four, and I actually want to camp out here because I didn't finish that. Moved on too quickly, and I just realized how important it is. What are the essentials? I gave you A, B, C, and D, four essentials to having a proper biblical Christian worldview. The first one was knowing your what? Epistemology, big word. We talked about that. That's a word that actually can be found in your Greek New Testament. And that is the study of what? Anybody? Yeah, it has to do with the study of knowledge. Study of knowledge. And why is that important? Uh, it's basically ask the question, how do you know anything at all to be true? How do you know anything at all to be true? Or do you even believe in truth? So what is your epistemology? How do you know that you know something? So we, we talked through that last week. We gave examples. But I want to ask a few more questions because there are some basic terms I didn't even define. So... I want to kind of beef up or bolster the Christian view of epistemology, and that's this theology of knowing or the theology of knowledge, which also is, if you're talking about knowledge, then from a Christian point of view, you're also talking about truth. So I want to talk about truth. How do you know anything at all? I, and I asked several of you last week, uh, do you tell me something you know with confidence on a scale of 1 through 10, 10 being most confident. Tell me something you know, 10 out of 10, you're absolutely confident, and several of you shared examples. One was that God is real, one of you said. You were totally confident, 10 out of 10. I know that God is real. Some of you talked about how many bones are in the human body, and it was 200 and something, or what was it? 206. 206. 206. Um, and then there are a couple other examples were given. So on the spiritual or religious statements that were made, like, I know with confidence, 10 out of 10, that God is real. My follow-up question, and this has to do with your, I'm testing your epistemology, your theory of knowledge. You say that God is real. How do you know that God is real? And then it starts to get a little more complicated to think that through. And that's what I'm doing is I'm forcing your presuppositions or assumptions your deepest seated convictions to the surface, whether you've even thought about them or not. We actually got different answers on some of the spiritual topics that I brought up. So, and what we're getting at there is, what is your standard of truth, your standard of truth, or what is your standard of authority? What is the ultimate standard of truth by which you determine anything to be true? And a couple of you that made spiritual statements that God is real or the Bible is true. Somebody said the Bible is true. I'm confident of that. They said they were a 10 out of 10, totally confident. And then when I asked them, how do you know the Bible is true? They said, because the Bible says so. I actually agree with that answer. 
but logicians and other secular people would say, well, that's a circular reasoning. You can't do that. And then Chi Lam came along and said, well, everybody has circular reasoning at some point in the end. And I said, what? And then I said, oh, yeah, I agree. That's how that conversation went. Because if you examine everybody's presuppositions, ultimately, you're going to find some circular reasoning there. So this is what we were getting at, is how do you know anything to be true? And if you ask different people of different religions on their most basic beliefs, and they say, oh, I believe this 10 out of 10. And we used example, for example, uh, Mormonism. If you asked a, a good Mormon who was knowledgeable, committed to their Mormon faith, uh, and asked them, do you believe Mormonism is true? They would say yes on a scale of 1 out of 10, 10 being strongest. What would you say? They'd say 10 out of 10. And then the typical Mormon, at least from my experience over the last 30 plus years. So you think Mormonism is true, 10 out of 10. How do you know it's true? How do you know it's true? And their answer typically is, because I, actually here's the typical answer, the standard one, formal answer is, because I have a burning in the bosom, quote, end quote. That's a real standard answer that they are, taught to depend upon and believe. I have a burning in the bosom. What's that? I, well, it really comes down, I, I've experienced it, or, um, so it's, ex, it's subjective. But that is definitely a standard they have for determining something to be true. Some might say, I believe it's true because I've experienced it. It has changed me. Some would say, because I believe this because it's empirically true and verifiable. If you ask an atheist how they know that God doesn't exist, they'll give you all kinds of different answers. One of the, do you know the most common answer of an atheist? When you ask them, how do you know God isn't, doesn't exist? How do you know that's true? One of the most popular answers they say. Robin? They will say, yeah, they'll usually say, it's, well, it's science has proven that God isn't true. But if you keep pushing, well, how's that? They will say, because can't, never seen him. Where is he? If your God is omnipresent and everywhere, okay, where is he? Show him, show him to me. So that's usually what they fall back on. So they like to say they believe in truth or reality based on empirical, verifiable evidence that you can uh, verify with all the senses. But they aren't consistent in that because they believe in plenty of things that they cannot see or tangibly verify through empirical senses, like just ask them, do you believe um, Thomas Jefferson was real? Yeah, well, we're, prove it. They can't prove that scientifically. Ultimately, they believe it by faith, but they won't admit that. So anyway, but that's the answer. So let's develop. I want to ask a couple more questions regarding uh, the Christian worldview and uh, particularly epistemology. One thing I don't think I told you last week is really what another way of stating this issue of your epistemology is answering this question. What, I'm going to put it in quotes, is truth? That's what epistemology is dealing with. It answers this question. What is truth? Now, this is a famous quote from who? Pontius Pilate. Somebody said it. So open your Bible. Look at John chapter 18. Pardon? John 18. Jesus has been arrested. It's the last week of his life. He's about to be crucified. He is being interrogated. Now, after being interrogated by the Jews and Caiaphas and the high priest, then they haul him off to Pilate, the Roman governor, and he begins to interrogate Jesus. Pilate's trying to get out of it, weasel out of this whole thing, saying, well, I'm not a Jew. So it's like, what does this have to do with me? Um, then one of the accusations is Jesus was claiming to be king, and Pilate's saying, wait, what? You're a, you're a king. Jesus didn't look like a king. Didn't look like royalty. Verse 37, John 18. Jesus uh, says to Pilate, well, Pilate asked him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. 
I was born as a king. I was born to be a king. And for this I have come into the world. I came into the world to be a king. And I came into the world to testify to the truth. Whoa. Jesus said, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then in verse 38, Pilate responds saying to Jesus, what is truth? So Pilate's actually being kind of sarcastic there. He's also being serious. Pilate probably didn't believe he could know or anybody could know definitively what truth is. So I think Pilate's kind of being honest there. He doesn't know what the truth is or how you can know truth. So that's the question of the ages right here. What is truth? So Jesus believed in truth. He believed there was a standard of truth. So this is epistemology. So let me ask you, according to the Bible, uh, oh, actually, before I give you the answers from the Bible about what is truth in answering this question, the ultimate standard of truth, what does the secular or non-Christian world say today regarding uh, truth? What might some popular things they say about truth? Yes, 100 people survey top five answers are on the board. Number one answer was, ding, that it is relative. That's what the world says. Truth is relative. And it's becoming more and more relative as time goes on. Even in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the, the view from, I think it was Joseph Fletcher or whoever that guy was that wrote that book and was talking, he popularized this notion that truth is relative, called it relative ethics. And it's just gotten worse since then. Um, so now it's, it, it is so relative that it's, you're, it's up to you as an individual. Um, you can define your own truth. So good answer, good answer. What else does the world say about truth today? Non-Christian views about truth. It's relative. What else? Popular ones. 100 people survey, top five answers are on the board. Number two, it is unknowable. Ding, 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 ding. The Gary family doing fantastic tonight. <laughs> Gary, you're supposed to let other siblings and family members guess. I, I have just stopped. Did you say unknowable? That is the number two answer. The world and their view of truth, they're kind of inconsistent because they say on the one hand, this is, it's unknowable, you can't really definitively know truth. Oh, by the way, the truth that you can know is relative. Those actually contradict one another. 100 people survey top five answers. Well, how about one more? What does the world typically say? This, about, this will probably give an you're raising your hand on Family Feud. You do not raise your hand oh, on Family oh, yeah. Feud. You just shout it out. Oh, you just shout it out? Yeah, you're so polite. That's a very polite family. The Douglas family, very polite people. Anyway, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I'm going to put that here as a, it's so personal that it's actually my, that's under the umbrella of relative truth, which leads me to my third one. That is um, proof, like to prove something that's true, something, I don't know. Say that again. Proof, proving something, like if it's truth, you have to prove it, right? So know. it must, so truth must be proven? Proven. I think that was number six, top five answers on the board, but I'm going to write it down anyway. <laughs> Sounds good. you gotta, you got to prove it. No, that's actually important. Uh, you got to prove, prove it, prove it, prove it. Because they do, prove it, prove Jesus rose from the dead, prove it. So you're right. Okay, we're going to move it up to number five. Top five answers on the board. Number five, prove it. Okay, one more. Doesn't matter. I'm going to uh, say this one here, uh, that it changes. It changes. Truth changes. Can you think of an example of a basic, fundamental, universal truth throughout all of human history that now there's a new truth and interpretation of it? Because people thought Earth was flat and they realized it's sphere. No. Okay, so people, well, that's what people believed, but the truth never changed on that, right? That's true. But, so what's a supposed truth? We're told, yeah, this used to be true, but, you know, it's modern times. We don't believe that's not true anymore. Yeah, there you go. Probably, that's what I was thinking of. 
yeah, historically, the old archaic view that was actually true for several thousand years was that there's only two human genders, male and female. But, you know, uh, for whatever reason, times are changing, evolution, science is developing. We're less racist and biased today. Therefore, that truth is changing. It's literally changing and morphing. So now we know it used to be in the 90s that they came up with six genders. I don't know if you knew that. Six. And now, according to Facebook, there's what? 50. It was 50-something the last time I saw. Is it in the 60s now? 50-some-odd genders now. So truth is changing. So this is a very popular view in the world, that truth changes. Um, not only, yeah, gender, you can even, it used to be true for thousands of years that the baby that was born with its biological anatomy determined its gender, or you could define it as, a, it's a boy when the baby's born, or it's a girl, not anymore. So the truth is now you can assign it a different gender by fiat. Poof, you're not a boy. Um, so that's changed. So that's a good example. So, but that's the world's, that's, that is a secular worldview. And the presupposition of that is truth, if there is any, can change. Truth, it's true for me. Yet at the same time, they, some, same, some people might say that truth is actually unknowable. But if you were to ask that person who said that, yeah, uh, genders are changing, it's true that now there are more, we used to believe that there are only two, now there's more, and that's true. If you were to ask that person, how do you know? How do you know that it's true that there are more than two genders? Who knows what they might say? They give you all kinds of different answers. So what I'm getting at there is what is their ultimate standard for truth? Is it fixed? Is it unchanging? Is it universal? all throughout time and history and across the world? Because that's the standard of truth that we are looking for if we want to have a Christian worldview. So now we're going to go to the Bible, now that we've looked at some secular worldly presuppositions about truth. By the way, these are, oh, this here comes from, I think, Gary, you said this, what is the root, what is this popularly known as today? The fact that truth cannot be known with any definitive certainty. You can't really know anything, is what we're being told, especially in the universities today for the last 30 years. What is that worldview? What's that belief? You can't know anything with certainty. It's called, it comes out of uh, literature, uh, in terms of the literature scholars of the early 20th century. Agnosticism? Uh, it is an agnosticism, and it was an agnosticism applied to literature, and then it trickled down into popular culture, and then it also spilled into the church, and it is called, thank you, it's called postmodernism. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. So postmodernism, supposedly the dominant worldview that we've been living under since the 1990s, reigns supreme in academia today, and now has trickled into society, that you cannot know anything at all uh, with confidence or definitively or 100%. Sadly, I've tested that thesis in the church for the last 20 plus years as a pastor at several different churches I've been a part of. And at times just to ask, either in a Sunday school class or a class I'm teaching or individual Christians, we get into this discussion and I'll ask them how, or when I'm talking to somebody who's going to get baptized, tell me what you believe about Jesus. Do you, do you believe Jesus uh, is the Savior? How sure are you if you died now you would go to heaven? It's a very important question, your certainty. And a lot of times you get some questions where, well, I'm not really sure, I'm not certain. And that's led into things like, so do you think we can know anything for certain? And I've talked to plenty of Christians or people who say they're Christians that you can't believe anything with 100% certainty, even the fact that Jesus is the Savior, Jesus existed or Jesus died. I'm like, really? Wow. And they say, well, I mean, ultimately we can't know anything with certainty. Now, Jesus didn't agree with that. Jesus believed, according to the way he taught, that you can actually know things with certainty. Anybody know how I know that off the top? Give me examples. From Jesus himself, the teachings of Jesus, where we can conclude that, wow, it sounds like Jesus believed in absolute certainty of truth. Anything come to mind? 
Did Jesus teach kind of wishy-washy, or was he black and white and dogmatic at times? He taught it with authority. He taught with authority, exactly. So Matthew chapter 7, he finishes the Sermon on the Mount. That's the first exposure to public teaching for a lot of those people in the crowd. Never heard Jesus teach before. He's going on waxing eloquent. And at the end, it says they were amazed by the authority with which he taught. It was a dogmatic assertive authority. So by virtue of the fact that he taught with authority, and that's how the crowds responded, so that's a good answer. How else do we know that Jesus taught with definitive certitude? You could count on it with your life. Specific things, specific words that he used. How about, you ever heard this one? Uh, oh, say that again. That's, yeah, whoa, whoa. Yeah, like in John chapter 6, where he says like 10 times, I am from above, you are from below. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. I came from my Father. Whoa, that's pretty authoritative. That's pretty certain. So the content of what he taught makes it sound like Jesus believed in absolute certainty. But even just more specifically, how many times have you heard Jesus say, truly, truly, I say to you. What's, what is truly, truly? That's amen, amen, or amen, amen, I say to you. You know what the Greek word there is? Actually, the Greek word is right from the Hebrew. It's, in the Hebrew, it's amen. In Greek, it's amen. In English, it's amen. It's the same word. What does amen mean? It means just one time, amen means with absolute confidence. You can count on it. It is dogmatically certain. It is true. You can take it to the bank. That's what it means. Amen, I say to you. So that's how we know that Jesus taught with absolute confidence and that we could know truth with absolute confidence just by his word choice. And not only did he say amen, he said amen, amen. That was a Hebrew idiom or a phrase or a way of making something absolutely emphatic. Not only just the word amen means emphatically true and binding, but amen, amen just compounded that and made it emphatic all the more. Truly, truly, I say to you. This is absolutely authoritative and binding. It is from God himself. So, so much for postmodernism that you can't be certain about anything. Uh, there are other phrases Jesus used. Another phrase was, uh, it, it is written. It is written. It is written. He says that many times in the Gospels. It is written. Literally, in the Greek text, it's, it stands written. In the perfect tense is what it means. And that means that it was definitively written in the past, about a completed action that has already happened in history with ongoing, guaranteed, continuous results. It stands written. It, and what was he talking about? Written where? When Jesus said it was written, he's talking about where? In the Old Testament. Scripture. It stands written. In other words, it is absolutely certain, and it is written in the Scriptures, and therefore it is authoritative because it came from God Himself. You can count on it. That's what Jesus meant. One of His favorite sayings. It is written, it is written, it is written. Or when he wanted to insult the Pharisees who thought they knew everything? Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you? That was an insult. It's in the Bible. It's in Scripture. You should know this. This is true. This is undeniable. How foolish are you? How ignorant are you? So there's Jesus, the master teacher, the greatest rabbi that ever was because he was, is the God-man. Just blows up this whole idea that is foisted upon us from the secular world that Postmodernism is true that tells us we can't know anything with definitive certainty. Yes, we can. And that's what really sets the Christian worldview apart from every other view in the world. Because we can say things so dogmatic. As a matter of fact, that's a common critique against Christians. Is that they'll listen to a Christian or say you're watching, Larry King used to be on TV, CNN, he'd interview people and religious people and he'd have a panel of five different religious people. He'd have uh, a Muslim and a liberal Jew and some kooky uh, guy that believed in mysticism or whatever and then maybe an agnostic or atheist and then you have maybe a fundamentalist kind of a Christian person that believed in the Bible. And on the panel, usually it was the Christian, the Bible-believing Christian who believed in things with the most certainty and they came across very confidently and they would say things rather dogmatically and very black and white. And that made everybody else bristle and they didn't like that. 
How can you be so certain? How can you be so true? That's arrogant. How can you be so confident? Because they, they didn't like that certainty. On the most basic things, like if you don't repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ, then when you die, you will go to hell. So not only is that reality offensive, but the, uh, the ease with which they spoke it also offended them. How do you know? You don't know that. So they were offended by this certainty. And that was also true of Jesus because he taught with certainty. People were offended by him so much so that they took up stones to stone him to death. And many times he whoosh, slipped away so that he wouldn't get killed because it wasn't the time yet. And in the end, that's one of the reasons why they killed him. Because of his certainty, his dogmatism about truth. There's black and there's white. There's right and there is wrong. So with that, we have to, uh, to have a proper Christian epistemology as a rock-solid foundation for your worldview. We didn't cover this last week. You need to know what your ultimate standard of truth is. Is there a standard of truth? And if so, what is it? God's truth. Okay, God's truth. And what is God's truth? The Word of God. Is, is the Word of God the same thing as the Bible? Is there a, a verse that says the Bible is the Word of God? Somebody? Because several of you said, Leo, you got one? Say that again. Are you, so you're, are you quoting the Bible? Okay. Well, if they're reading the Bible, so, uh, so we're getting warm. Is there a statement in the Bible itself that calls itself the Word of God is what I'm asking? The, uh, Robin, what did you say? John 1.1 1, 1 is talking about Jesus, not about Scripture. It does say the Word of God. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's talking about Jesus as the Word. But where does uh, the Bible actually call itself the Word of God, Gary? Um, the Timothy verse talking about all Scripture is God. Okay. So 2 Timothy 3.16 says, uh, all Scripture is God-breathed. Theopanoustos is the Greek word, but it says it's God-breathed, but it doesn't say it's the Word of God in that passage. I would agree with you that through context, we could probably determine it is talking about the written scriptures as authoritative coming from God. So I would agree with you on that. Uh, I'm just being a devil's advocate because the critics will say, nowhere does the Bible actually say that written scripture is, quote, the word of God. Because could you have the word of God without scripture? That's a yes or no question. In history, could you have the word of God without scripture? Okay, so the answer changed. So, she went in history, could you have the Word of God without Scripture? Well, there are many sayings of Jesus that didn't get recorded. So, those are still the Word of God. In the word of God. But by virtue of the fact that Jesus, Jesus is God. Is God. Okay. Well, okay, we're going in the right direction. What else? When in history could something be considered the Word of God that was not written Scripture? Well, before it was written. Before it was written, therefore, when it was... Yes. Even just like in Genesis and when he created the, the Well, I'm going to go back to your first statement, Chris, that's, uh, that's true. And I'm just going to say, in the Old Testament, whenever a prophet got up and said, Thus saith the Lord, a true prophet, and then say Jeremiah, and then he preached and spoke, that was the Word of God. Not everything Jeremiah preached is the Word of God was written down. But much of what he said was from God. So... Even spoken words from legitimate prophets were equal to, the, they were actually called the Word of God. So, uh, it, to answer my question, it was possible to have the Word of God that's totally authoritative that wasn't written down in the writings, spoken by the prophets, uh, or spoken by God to, to maybe to Abraham, and Abraham passed that truth on, um, or to Noah, God talked to Noah, and that was passed on. That's the Word of God. So, um, but I was just trying to, it's easy for us as Christians to say, to equate the Bible with the Word of God, and we've got to think that through um, how we end up there. Because I, I agree, right now, 
for us today, this, the Bible is the written Word of God. And I think there are a couple of verses that uh, you can make that argument. 2 Timothy 3.16, as Gary mentioned, along with a couple others, Hebrews 4.12 and John 17.17 17 and others, we could conclude, oh, 1 Peter chapter 1, that yes, what we have in our hands, we can call it, the I would say, the written Word of God. And Jude chapter 3 says, this is everything God wanted us to have. So there is a standard of truth. Uh, according to some of you, and you said um, the Bible. Or we'll say Scripture. So let's get a... I'm going to use a Bible verse for each one of these. Standard of truth. What is your standard of truth? Uh, I'm going to say John 17, 17. Well, there's a lot of other passages I could use in the Gospel of John where Jesus refers to Scripture and equates it with being true. But in John 17, 17, He's praying to the Father and He says, Thy word is truth. Standard, the standard of truth for the Christian. I would say is fourfold. Uh, what else is the standard of truth for the Christian? What is the ultimate truth? We said the Bible. What else? You're thinking too hard. Somebody, <laughs> there it is. Got 100 people surveyed. Top four answers on the board. Actually, they, these, cannot, these are not, uh, they're all equal actually. So I'm going to put God as in, by that I mean the Father. And this, again, we're just going to stick with the Gospel of John. We go a lot of different places. I think it's John 3.33. John the Baptist, witness of God, prophet of God, said that very thing. Uh, that God is true. He's talking about the Father. God, or Yahweh, is true. Okay, what else? So this is, our stand, this is the Christian worldview. The Christian has an ultimate standard of truth. It is objective. We can identify it. I think it all comes out of, from God's revelation itself. God is truth. His word is truth. What else? Jesus. Wait, I heard it. Say it a little louder. Like, Jesus. There it is. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus is truth. Alma, Jesus is truth. You believe that? Yes, Amen. <laughs> Do we have a Bible verse? Can anybody say it? Where did, where did Jesus say he was the truth? Did Jesus ever say he was the truth? Yes. With a definitive article. Yes, he did. And how did he say it? I am the way, the truth, definite article, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me. And that's in the Gospel of John. John 14, 6. One more. The Holy Spirit. It's got to be. It's got to be up there. It's got to be up there. I'm going. I'm crossing my fingers. Ding, ding, ding. Good answer. Good answer. The Holy Spirit is truth. Is that in the Bible somewhere, Akil, or did you just make that up? Yeah. Guess. Guess which book. Take a wild guess. Take. Take a guess. John. Good answer. Good answer. How about John 14? It's also in John 16, but. John 14, Jesus is talking to His apostles, His disciples. He's about to leave. He's saying the promise of the Holy Spirit is coming. And He, several times, but here's one. The Spirit of truth. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just speak truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. That's what He's called. The Holy Spirit is truth. Jesus is truth. Scripture is truth. God Himself is truth. That's all. And I could give you a zillion other verses for all four of these truths. Let God be true and every human a liar, says Romans, and the Old Testament. So what is your epistemology? So say you're going to work tomorrow and you run into a colleague in the coffee room and they say, what's your epistemology? And you say, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yes, um, I believe in ultimate, transcendent, definitive, objective, universally binding truth. And my ultimate standard of truth is fourfold. Thank you for asking. What's your epistemology? That's kind of how the conversation can go. And you can tell them. My truth is fourfold. It's I believe that God is truth. Jesus is truth. 
the Holy Spirit is truth, or if you're in a hurry and want to shorten, you can just say the Trinity is truth, and so is the Bible. That's my standard of truth. So this is uh, basically the rock bed and foundation of having a Christian worldview. If this isn't your standard of truth, you don't have a Christian worldview. You have a crack in your Christian worldview. You have a deficiency in your Christian worldview. But for us, for the Christian, this is it. Do you believe in truth? Absolutely. Do you have a standard of truth that's ultimate, that never changes? Absolutely. It's binding and true for everybody? Yes. It's right here. Clear as a bell. And so we take everything in the world and we vet it through this grid right here. So the, is the Bible inferior to God? No. no. What is it then, Akil? You're the one that said no. I mean, they're all equally true. Okay, so I would agree with you. I don't think the Bible or Scripture is inferior to God because the, the, the Bible actually are God's thoughts. You cannot pit God's Word against Himself. That's a false dichotomy. People try to do that. Well, the Bible's just a book. God's up here. No. God is here. God has spoken, and God has preserved what He's said and what He actually thinks in His book called Scripture. And the Scriptures are God-breathed or inspired, says the King James. You can't separate God from His Word. Again, that's a false dichotomy to do that. Um, so they are equally binding. Equ By the way, because if you disobey Scripture, you are disobeying God. Uh, Michael, question? So, like, I understand when you say standard of truth, I can use the Bible to be a standard. But what do you mean by, like, the Father is a standard of truth? How do you measure? Is that a measure of truth? Or? Yeah. So, if you want to obey or do the right thing that pleases God, you want to do what God's, you want to please God, you want to please the Father, right? Yeah. You, you only want to do what pleases the Father in any given, I don't care what it is, right? How you treat your wife, how you raise your kids, how you handle your money, your ethic as you live in the world. Your ambition should be to please God the Father at all times. That's what Paul said in Corinthians. My aim and ambition is to please God in all things. And he's talking about God the Father. So the question is, how do you know? Well, that's your ambition, right? To please the Father. How do you know if you're pleasing the Father in any given situation? Yeah, the only way. The only way I can know whether I'm pleasing the Father or not is to go to the Bible. There's no other source to go to. Some people say, well, I can talk to God and we have a special relationship and He talks to me audibly. I'd say, no, no He doesn't. How do I know that? Because I could make an argument from Scripture saying, showing that God doesn't do that anymore. I had a vision of God. He told me in a dream. Really? Let's test that with Scripture. So the only way that you can know God's the Father's thoughts, desires, will for you is through Scripture. They are inseparable. So if your desire is to please Jesus in all things, the only way to know how to do that is to go to the Bible. If you want to avoid doing things that grieve Jesus, the only way to know that is to go to the Bible, to Scripture, to the written Word of God. That's the way God has done it. Hebrews chapter 1 in particular tells us that in times past, God spoke in many different ways, many diverse manners, says the King James, many different ways, through prophets, dreams, visions, people, sometimes audibly. And he said, today, in these last days, speaks to us through his son, Jesus, and Jesus commissioned his 12 apostles to write down scripture so that we would know the will of God and the mind of Christ. So, can't separate. So, this is the Christian standard of truth. Great question, Michael. Really practical one. Does that make sense? Or did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, we'll get to you in just a second, Chris, but wanted to welcome. Is it Jessica? Yes. Thanks for coming, Jessica. Oh, sorry. You made it. We're glad. Glad you're here. Um, and we'll get you cut up. We're just talking about truth. We're just talking about epistemology. No big deal. Uh, Chris, you had a question? So I feel a little, um, uh, confused by 
confused about tying the known, a, a person's known truth back to a person's faith. Because then some people will have a faith and some people will not have faith. So yeah, you, you raise a good point, by the way, which leads me to this. So we talked about this is our standard of ultimate truth. This is what I believe it is. But somebody could come along and say, so Pastor Cliff, how do you know that that is the definitive standard of truth? And then I would simply say, because I believe it. Because bottom line, it comes down to my faith. And it's not my faith. Uh, faith, supernatural, there's different kinds of faith. And there's only one kind of supernatural heavenly faith that is totally alien to human origin or human intuition. It's a gift from God. So the ability to believe in what God has revealed is called faith. Uh, so when we're, and that's a specific kind of faith, this is a different kind of faith. It's a divine faith. It's a heavenly faith. It's a supernatural faith. It's, um, an, some people call it, the old theologians, an alien faith. It's alien to human capabilities and it's not inherent or innate in us. It is strictly uh, alien faith in that God has to give it to us as humans. And scripture is clear that faith is a gift. I think of Ephesians chapter two, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift. Of God. Well, what is the gift? Well, in the Greek text, it's very clear what the antecedent of gift is. It's everything. It's the grace and the it's supernatural grace and supernatural faith. So faith is explicitly called a gift in Ephesians 2.8 from God. By the way, because you can have human, I mean, people call it faith, but it's not really faith. It's kind of a, it's a quasi-human faith. It's an earthly faith. It's not divine. It's not supernatural. Everybody has it. You can be an, uh, an atheist and have it, and a Christian, that's a limited kind of faith. For example, uh, I'm going to sit in this chair, and the fact that I just sit down in the chair without worrying about, oh, is the leg going to break? Is it, am I going to fall? But I just sit down, and there it is. I'm exercising faith. I'm putting faith in that chair. That's not real. That's not faith. That's not what we're talking about here. That's actually based on... Uh, experience really. You did it the last 50 times and it works, I'm going to do it again and there was no problem. Uh, almost instinct. So that's not what we're talking about here. Everybody has that. But this is a gift from God. So you actually can't even believe in divine heavenly revelation unless God enables you to believe. And there's only one way you can have this heavenly divine supernatural faith that is totally alien to being a human being. We don't have it on our own. It has to come from God. And how do we get it? It, yes, there's only one way. Only one way. Romans 10, 17. Chapter talking about how you become a Christian, how you get saved. It comes down to faith, and it's not any kind of faith. It's a supernatural, heavenly, divine faith. It's a gift from God. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. And that's the only way that saving faith comes. If you don't have exposure to, this is divine revelation. If you don't have exposure to divine revelation, then you can't have this believing faith that changes and transforms. You have to have exposure to scripture. You have to have exposure to the word of God. You can't be saved apart from it. That's why today you can't become a Christian apart from hearing the word of God, scripture. Because faith, saving faith only comes from hearing the word of God. I think the King James says hearing a word about Christ or one of those other translations. Same thing. It's divine revelation that you have to be exposed to. That's why if you got some, your next door neighbor grew up in an atheist home and they've never heard anything about the Bible, you've got to tell them the Bible. You've got to give them the Word of God so that God can use His Holy Spirit and the truth that they're hearing from the Bible to create faith in them, enabling them to believe the truth about Christ. Bob, you were going to say? Yeah, so that's why uh, when we say that we are saved through the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, Paul said to the Corinthians, Hey, Corinthians, when I came into this town, you were totally pagan. And for 18 months, I 
imparted biblical truth to you. I preached to you the Word of God. Literally, I preached the gospel to you. What's the gospel? It's divine revelation that you find in Scripture about Jesus, who He is, and His death. And you got saved by hearing the truth of the gospel that came from Scripture. That's how you got saved. That's the only way to get saved. It comes only by faith. So going back to Chris's observation, that is actually totally true. You can't escape the faith issue here. And we talked a little bit about that last week, that even people who say they don't have faith, they do. They're believing in something. Richard Dawkins says he believes that God doesn't exist, and when he's pressed, he says that there was a big bang. How does he know there's a big bang? That's not scientific. That's not empirical. You can't observe that. He wasn't around 14 billion years ago. He believes that by faith. Bottom line. And then when he was asked, so where did the big, what was around before the Big Bang? Uh, aliens came and seeded this planet or this universe. Really? How do you know that? He doesn't know that. So if you keep pushing people back into a corner, in the end, it's all about faith. It's just the way you can't escape it as a human because we're finite and we don't know everything. We're not omniscient. Um, so, Chris, did you have any other follow-ups on that? Because I cut you off as you were talking. No, Okay. Leo, are you tracking with us? I know we're getting heavy, man. I'm trying to keep it at your level, too, so you can understand. But you're doing a good job. All right, let's go on in our handy day. So everybody understand epistemology? You comfortable with your epistemology? And you can't have a Christian worldview without a biblical epistemology, theory of knowledge. Um, so let's go to, back to the essentials. Epistemology, determining your, your ultimate authority is truth, God's truth, God himself. Wait, did we define truth? Here we are talking about truth, and we didn't even define it. Silly me. Somebody got a good definition of truth? Truth is... The philosophers have a very simple definition. Francis, do you believe in truth? Yeah, I heard you. You said yes. Therefore, you must know what it is. Truth is, I'll write it on the board, because we need a definition of truth. And then we can uh, define it together. Truth is, anybody? Just shout it out. I won't call on your name, so you don't have to be embarrassed. Just shout it out. Truth is what? Jessica, did you say something? Yeah, the truth is what is true. The truth is what is true? I'm going to write it down here. The truth is what is true. I did not establish any parameters for giving a definition. That's my fault. Okay, so the rules of giving a definition is you can't use the word in the definition. <laughs> that's, that's the rule of the dictionary. But I like it, because I actually agree with that. But it, you can't do that in making a definition. Monica? Fact. Fact? Mmm. Truth is fact. Fact. Now, I agree with that too, but that doesn't help because, because what's the next follow up question? What is a fact? So that really doesn't get us out of the bind that we are in. Truth is unchangeable. Truth, is that a definition or is that just saying what it's not? Truth is a revelation from God. Truth is revelation from God. So, uh, Kiel said it was unchangeable, which I would agree with. That's describing it, but not defining it. That's an attribute of it. Truth is immutable, you could say. Uh, it is revelation from God. Is that what you said, Chi? Yeah. Okay. Truth is what God says it is. Okay. So, I would agree with this statement here. Truth is revelation from God. Um, that's a generic observation, but if we want to get a little more specific, Pastor Bob says it is, say that again. It is what God says it is. It is what God says it is. Okay. What God says it is. Uh, somebody else say something different? It's Jesus. Truth, okay, that's cheating, Alma. 
Okay, you, you can't use you can't use scripture, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. A human definition. Um, so here's this is we are getting really close. Actually, truth is, this is actually correct, Pastor Bob. Technically, truth is what God says it is because He is true. As Almond's getting out here. So the reason now the philosophers tell us truth is that which corresponds to, what do you think? One more word. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. So that's a philosopher's definition, a generic. Problem is it's an atheistic. In other words, it doesn't even include God in that definition, so an atheist can agree with this definition. So technically, from a biblical Christian worldview, actually, what, that's why what Bob says is correct here. You can't have truth apart from God, His being, His person, and everything He said, because He, by His very nature, is true. So this is probably the best, concise definition of truth according to the Bible. Truth is, reality is, you could say that. Reality is what God says it is. He's the one that defines it. There's no definition apart from what God has said about it, because He Himself is truth. He speaks truth. They're inescapable. So uh, that would be my definition of truth. Truth is, is what God says it is. Um, or you could say truth is that which corresponds to reality as God has defined it. Same thing. But your definition of truth has to be in direct relation to God, the God of the Bible. Otherwise, you really don't have truth. So there's a definition of truth. And as a result, we have... Okay, we've covered everything I wanted to cover uh, on epistemology. Okay, now let's take a little break and let's get a little exercise. Hey, we didn't do a sword drill. Michael, you weren't here last week. We did a sword drill. Did we do a sword drill the week before that? Okay, so do you know what a sword drill is? Jessica, do you know what a sword drill is with the Bible? Okay, here's your sword. Ephesians 6 says the Word of God is a sword. You fight Satan with it. It is truth. That's a double-edged sword. Anybody else need a Bible for the sword drill? You have to have a Bible for the sword drill. Otherwise, um, you might, yeah, you can't qualify. Okay, here we go. So, does anybody else need a, oh, Francis, do you have your Bible with you? Two more? Sword one and sword two, go ahead. Gary needs a sword. Careful, don't cut yourself. And one more. Everybody got one? That's like, whoa! This is like a, what do they call that? You need two hands. That would be, a, what do they call? That's like a broadsword. <laughs> Goliath. Goliath had one that David could hardly lift. That's what that is. So here's a dagger. So the way a sword drill, wait, Jessica, did you say you've, you've ever done a sword drill with the Bible? Yes or no? No, okay. So that was true of most people last week. Uh, so the Bible says, or the Bible says it calls itself a sword. It's the sword of truth, and it's a weapon, and we can use it offensively and defensively, and we have to practice to use our sword, to use it well, to know what it says, to know how to use it, be discerning. And so this sword drill is one way of practically learning to get to know our Bible. Uh, so the way this works is... Uh, we will say swords up, and then you, you pull your sword out of your sheath. <laughs> now, it's not a lightsaber. <laughs> it's a sword, so don't confuse those. Anyway, you pull, and then you put your sword up in the air like so, and this is the ready position. So when I say swords up, you put your sword up like this. And I think, did I say last week that your elbow had to be locked? I can't remember. Yeah, because that is, that's a technicality. You could be disqualified. And your elbow has to be above nose level. It can't be down here. It's, so it has to be up here like that. You also, holding it has to be, you can't hold the binding like that either. Because number one, you might cut yourself. Number two, it's a disadvantage for others. So you hold the Bible on that side. I, I, I'm watching every detail. Uh, I said last week, oh, that I was the judge of the competition. So I'll say uh, swords up, and then you go ahead and put your swords up like so. We'll wait till everybody gets in the proper position. I'm looking for locked elbows, straight arm, excellent, excellent form. 
Those out in TV land, they have excellent form, so you know. Then I give you the name of a book and then a verse. And as soon as I say the verse, you, in sitting down, you can look up that verse as fast as you can. And then as soon as you find it, you must put your finger on the verse. Only after you have your finger on the verse are you allowed to stand up. And I'll be watching for the first person standing up. And if you don't have your finger on the verse, I will not call on you. Because some, some people go, uh, you can put your hands down. I'm sorry. Go ahead and put your hands down. Because I'm explaining it because we've got two new people. But if you have your finger on it, as soon as you're standing, then I will call on you. And then you read the verse. And if it's correct, then you are the winner and you are the fastest Bible in the West. And that's really exciting. Yeah, no, seriously. I'm not laughing, I'm serious. And, but if you read the verse and it's the wrong verse, that could be really embarrassing because we have a TV audience tonight. <laughs> yeah, and it's being recorded. And if you read the wrong verse, then you'll hear a noise, probably something like, <clears throat> like that. And that means you've got to sit down. And we go to whoever was in second place, and we'll ask them. And we'll just keep going until we get the right verse. Whew, that was a lot, but uh, we want to do this right. Okay, so, uh, swords up, Genesis 6-5, Genesis 6-5. I'm sorry, that is not the proper, it was Leo, Leo was second, and then we had Pastor about Leo, read the verse. Beautiful. Let's hear it for Leo. <laughs> Fastest Bible in the world. Oh, I'm not even going to ask. Where in the world were you reading from? Genesis 6. That didn't even sound familiar. Are you sure that was the Bible you were reading from? But anyway. Okay. All right. Yeah, the Bible. Yeah. All right, Eve. Whatever, Adam. Um, Leo, great book called Think Biblically. It's a, it's a Christian worldview book. Congratulations. The Bible he gave me. She's blaming it on her husband. Um, that's, that's biblical, though, blaming it on your husband. So I, I chose Genesis 6-5 because early on, God creates everything, literally, in Genesis chapter 1, and then on day 6, after he created humanity, he created everything. He was done creating, and he said, and then God said, it is very good. Meaning it was perfect. That was before the fall. There was no sin. There was no corruption. There was no curse. Everything was exactly the way that he wanted it. It was pristine. Very good. Adam and Eve uh, were married. Celebrating, I think, their one-day anniversary. Perfect harmony, perfect marriage. And then time goes by, and then they disobey, then they're sin, and then they are cursed. The earth is cursed. Their descendants will be cursed. So they will bring forth and children into this world who are sinful from the womb. And then their children will give birth to sinful children from the womb. And then there will be an explosion of population around the world, and that's exactly what happened in Genesis. And so there were many, 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 many human beings at that time, and they were all sinful, wretched to the core. And it, uh, violence was now dominating the world, and God is looking on as the creator of the creation that he had made originally very good, and now he sees nothing but sin and wickedness, not just externally all over the world with murder, but he also diagnoses the heart in Genesis 6-5. That the thoughts and the intentions of every human being just utterly corrupt and evil, which is a diagnosis of all of us today, by the way. And as a result, God brought in the flood as punishment. So um, that, uh, that was all real. That's all historical. It all really happened, just like it said. That's a proper diagnosis of a human being, of you and me. That's our biography, Genesis 6-5. That is a Christian worldview on anthropology, on humanity. We are not born pristine. We are not born uh, neutral. We're not born morally good. We are born children of wrath, separated from God, enemies of His, 
with a horrible, wicked, vicious sin nature, even as a two-day-old baby, because that's what the Bible says. Um, and that has everything to do with our worldview and how we view the world, how we view God ourselves and humanity. All right, good job. So let's go on to the next page where we actually started this last week, and that was the prerequisites to a biblical Christian worldview. We talked about knowing the gospel. Uh, so you have to know the gospel, but you, have, you don't just have to know the gospel, you have to actually be saved. You have to be a Christian, you have to be born again. So I want to go on the all-important question of the gospel here. What is the gospel? Boy, there is a lot of confusion on this. Because I would propose, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, you can't be a Christian unless you know the gospel. You cannot be a Christian unless you believe the gospel. Those are two different things. They complement one another. Um, when someone wants to get baptized or join the church, I'll ask him, what is the gospel? Every once in a blue moon, I'll get answers that seem a little muddled and unclear. Like, here's a common one. What is the gospel? Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is not what I'm talking about. But those four books are actually called the gospels, right? So we need a biblical definition of what we're talking about. But before we do, let's look. Everybody turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll read the first three verses. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul. This is like 53 AD. This is so that's what, 20 years after Jesus died? Paul was a Pharisee. He used to kill Christians and persecute them and kill them. Then he got saved. God changed him. He went from being a guy, being Saul, changed his name to Paul. And now God made him an apostle and a missionary and a church planter and a pastor and a person now who loved people and loved God and loved Christ. He's been serving in ministry for 10 plus years now. He planted a church in Corinth. He pastored there for 18 months, then he left. And then he sent a letter there, probably from Rome or someplace, five years after he planted the church. And he just wanted to see how the church was doing that he once was with and was their pastor and loved them dearly. He heard they were having problems in the church. They were confused. They were fighting with one another. Can you imagine that? People in the local church fighting with one another. That's why he had to write this letter because there was a lot of division. Some of them were being immoral and tolerating immorality in the church. Some of them were being very selfish, self-centered, and they were suing each other. And some of them had wrong doctrine. So they, I mean, this whole epistle, he's just solving all kinds of problems. But chapter 15, he, they were confused about what the resurrection is all about. But he starts it out this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, he calls them brethren, that includes the females there as well. That is a term of affection, and that's a term he was using that he would call Christians. So he's assuming, giving them the benefit of the doubt, that they are believers, they're Christians, they profess to know Christ. So now I'm going to make known to you, brethren, fellow believers, the gospel. There it is. I'm going to explain to you the gospel. Literally, I'm going to define the gospel for you. This is the only sentence like that in the entire Bible that says this about the gospel. I am going to define the gospel definitively, and in one sentence Paul does it. Well, which gospel? Well, he describes it first. Well, the one that I preached to you. So Paul uh, was a missionary, church planner, pastor, and he only did one thing, and that was he preached the gospel. That was it. He didn't do soup lines or soup kitchens. He was not an advocate of social justice or anything like that, or the social gospel. It was, he was a very focused. One thing, I preached the gospel. He makes that clear in many, almost all of his epistles. And that's what he did when he went to Corinth. He went there, he didn't try to change the culture. He talked to individuals and just preached about Jesus. That was it. Very simple, single-minded. And he preached, and he only preached one thing, it was the gospel, whatever that is which you also received. So when he preached the gospel, these pagans, and they were as pagans as you can get in Corinth, incredibly immoral, idolatrous, disgusting actually. But he loved them in Christ, so he preached the gospel to them. Some of them believed because it says they received his message, in which also you stand because you believe that it's, by, it's where you have, now you have stability in life. Why do you have stability in a very unstable world? Because you received the gospel. Verse 2, 
by which also you were saved. So the gospel saved you. You can't be saved any other way. You can't be saved by good works. You can't be saved by obedience. You can't be saved by going to church. You can't be saved by the church. You can't be saved by human beings. You're saved one way. It's through the gospel. Accepting the gospel, believing the gospel. By which also you are saved. That is, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what he's saying there is, as long as you understood what I was preaching and believed it, as long as you weren't self-deceived when you said you believed, but if you truly did understand and you truly believed, then you are saved. Notice it's past tense. You can know that you're saved in this life. You can know with confidence that you are saved in this life. That's how he's talking to him. By the way, starting with our definition of gospel, the word gospel means? Good news. Good news. Very important. If you knew Greek, that would be blatantly obvious, uh, the word. Good news. You. Angelion. Is the literal word. Good news. Gospel is euangelion. This is actually one word. I just wrote it out this way because this is the root word and here's a prefix. We actually have this prefix in English, EU on the front of words. So think of some words with EU on the front. What are they? Education. EU. That's E-D. Euro. What? Euro. 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 Keep going. Eulogy. 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 Euphoria. Eulogy, euphoria, you said Eucharist? You, Eucharist? What? Utopia is like this, but it actually. <laughs> it's, uh, in terms of its etymology, that's where it comes from. So that's correct. So what is this? What does this mean? Based on our English words? EU is what? Good. 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 So, and then eulogy, you logos. Logos is what? Words. Good words. Good eulogy are good, good words you say about a dead person at their funeral because you didn't say anything nice about them when they were alive. Eulogy. <laughs> That's why we have eulogies. Good. So, good. What does this look like? That's exactly what it is. In Greek, the New Testament, Greek New Testament, you know what this means? Angelos? That's how you pronounce it? You know what it means? Thank you. Somebody said it. Messenger. That's what an angelos is, a messenger. So what is this word, euangelion? It's a good message, and that's what we translate as good news. And then we simplify it when we say gospel. So that's what it is. Uh, um, and by the way, a messenger can be either a human messenger or a spirit messenger, known as either an angel or a demon. So it can be a human messenger, an angelic spiritual messenger. It can be a good messenger or a bad messenger. That's what the word means. So gospel means good news. Good message. It's a good message. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I want to make known to you the gospel, the euangelion, the good news which I preached to you. And it's, it's, if you believed it, it's what saved you. Here it is, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here's his definition in the middle of verse 3. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. The definition of gospel according to the Bible, the Apostle Paul, verse 3 and verse 4, that's the definition of the gospel. That Christ died for sins, and that He was buried and raised again. And that is all according, it was all talked about in the Old Testament scriptures. That's the gospel. And if you don't believe that, you cannot be saved. You can't be a Christian. You're not born again. You can't be adopted in the family of God. You won't go to heaven. And it's by believing. 
So the elements of the gospel, what's the first main element? It's Christ, Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have a gospel. It's who Jesus is and what He did. Jesus is the good news. You can't be saved apart from Christ. He is the, the very foundation and center of the gospel. Uh, but you also have to know not just who Christ is. By the way, uh, most succinctly and distinctly, what would you say? To define Christ, Christ is what? Because we have to know a biblical view of Jesus. Because the whole world believes in Jesus. My oldest brother believes in Jesus and believes that he... Uh, he believes that he is like Jesus. So he believes he's becoming deity like Jesus became deity. So he was explaining that to me. He was like, no, I don't think you understand who Jesus is. Does, does Islam believe in Jesus? Yes. yes, they do. Jesus is mentioned, I believe, 97 times in the Quran. Does, do the Mormons believe in Jesus? Yes, yes they do. It's in the coven, uh, the, all their four different spiritual books, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. Um, so just everybody has a view of Jesus, everybody believes in Jesus for the most part, but we have to believe the right thing about him, otherwise you believe in a false Christ, as Matthew 24 says, 1 John 5 and 2 Corinthians 12. So what's the most definitive biblical definition of Christ? He is, Son of God. I'm going to say the God-man. That's the biblical view of Christ. If you don't believe that, you can't be saved, that he is the God man. He was God. He became a man. 100% man. Uh, when did Jesus begin to exist? Okay, I heard several different answers. Say it again. He's always existed. Who created him? Nobody. He is uncreated. He is eternal. He's always existed. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can we pray to Jesus? Yes. yes. Why? Because he's the God man. Is he different than the Father? Or is, is, the, is He the same as the Father? Yes. No. He is a distinct person from the Father. Yes? yes? Yes. Correct. Is He equal to the Father in glory, deity? Yes. So this is the unique Christian view. You can't be saved apart from believing this. You have to believe in what He did. The main thing that Jesus did was for sin is that He died. He died for sin. Uh, when G who, who punished Jesus when He died on the cross? God the Father, Isaiah 53. Did Satan punish Jesus when Jesus was on the cross? No. God the Father punished Jesus on the cross. Isaiah 53, as I said. He died as a substitute for sinners. His death is also called a ransom. Jesus paid a price to set sinners free. What was the price that he paid? His blood. That's the price that was paid. Who did Jesus pay that price to? He paid it to the, did he pay it to Satan? No. no. Many believe that. No. He paid it to the Father. So he died for sin, was buried, and then rose again. Resurrection. So the resurrection is part of the gospel. You must believe in the gospel in order to be saved and born again. Can you be a Christian and reject the resurrection of Christ? No, you cannot. Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you shall be saved. So that in a nutshell is the gospel. And this is by faith. This is supernatural faith that God gives you as a gift to believe this. Okay, uh, question. Chi Lam. In uh, verse 5 it says, uh, and then it appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Do you think that is also the part of the gospel message? That is not the gospel message. That is the testimony of two or three witnesses validating the truth of the gospel message. And that was based on Jewish thought, Mosaic thought. No truth could be established or verified apart from the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then that's why Paul goes on. Not only did Jesus have two to three witnesses, he had almost 500 plus witnesses who saw him risen from the dead. So you couldn't argue with it. It was validated to be true according to the Old Testament standard which was the highest standard of validating truth. So, uh, in order to have a biblical Christian worldview, you've got to know the gospel, you have to believe in that gospel, and as a result, you need to be born again. Uh, and you can know that you're born again in this life, and you can know it with certainty, that's the promise of Christ Himself. You need to know the Bible, and you need to know it well. You need to know the whole counsel of God, because if you're talking about any given issue, that issue and your view of it needs to be informed by the whole Bible and not just part of the Bible.
Because if you only have one aspect of biblical truth on a given issue, then you have a distorted, lopsided view on that issue. And that's, that's bad news. That can actually be very damaging. So we took a quiz last week on your Bible knowledge, the little diagnostic, remember that? Just to, from Genesis to Revelation, just to see where you are on a few topics. So we gotta know the word, we gotta be Bereans, we gotta be searching the word uh, to have a proper view. I, put, I called it having a systematic theology on any given topic, and then I put a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, topics down there. For example, if I were to ask you, what is the Christian worldview or the biblical position on divorce? What is it? Okay, so Chi Lam, is that, is, that, is that the definitive, complete biblical worldview of divorce? Okay, so <laughs> somebody said, what is the biblical view of divorce? God hates it. Uh, I would say this statement is true, and I would say this isn't really even close to the fully orbed biblical position on divorce. This is absolutely essential. Question, follow up here. What sin does God not hate? None. Good answer, good answer. God hates every sin. As a matter of fact, every sin is worthy of death. Eating a fruit, apparently, was pretty bad because God told Adam, in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. So God hates sin. He hates all of it. As a matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, he says, Yea, verily, six sins I hate, woe, seven. And he lists what they are. Um, a lying tongue, a, a, and then he talks about the eyes, uh, feet that flee from whatever. And he lists seven sins that God hates with a passion. Lying, stealing, etc. And then here, a lot of times our view of divorce is we make it sound like, well, this is the only sin that God hates. Um, but it is true. God does hate divorce, but He hates every sin. So this is not the complete view of divorce. What else? So we want a fully orbed, fully informed, biblical position on divorce because that's the Christian worldview. That's what I mean by the whole counsel of God needs to speak to this issue. What are other bullet points we could put up here? Allowance. Is divorce, okay, is divorce a sin? Yeah. Yep. Uh, allowance, what do you mean by that, Bob? Yeah, so in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, God made an allowance for divorce. Why? Because of the hardness of the heart of humanity. What does he mean by that? Well, um, God is really kind of accommodating to our finite and sinfulness, so you've got to have allowance. Not all divorce, not all parties involved with divorce are being sinful. That's very important. You could have a, a couple who's married, a man and wife, and one of them maybe pursues divorce or bails and leaves their spouse sinfully where the other one didn't sin at all and wanted to preserve the marriage. So not every party is guilty with sin, but, it, but in any divorce at some point you could say, oh, there's where the sin was. But not everybody involved necessarily is guilty of sin. So they're actually innocent. There could be innocent people involved in a divorce. Uh, is there such a thing as a biblical divorce? Or a legitimate divorce, an illegitimate divorce? Yeah. Okay, well, well, is there an illegitimate divorce? Yes. So that would need to be a part of our worldview. Is there a legitimate? I would say yes. Are there instances, allowances made for a biblical divorce? Yes, in the New Testament there is. What are they? Sexual immorality, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus himself said it. I believe 1 Corinthians 7 also. If the unbelieving spouse leases, leaves the believing spouse, that's two, at least two uh, biblical instances of a legitimate divorce. Um, so anyway, we got to know everything the Bible has to say about this. Did you know that God got divorced? Yeah, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. That's what he said. God divorced Israel and then initiated restitution or reconciliation. 
he still committed to Israel. Um, so this is what I mean by having a complete systematic theology on any given issue. Because if you, if you only had one, say you said, uh, no, everything about divorce is sinful and wrong, and say you're like a pastor at a church, and this is how you counsel everybody and deal with people in your church that are dealing with divorce, going through divorce, and you're just saying, eh, everybody involved is sinful and guilty, and if you divorce under any circumstances, it's sin and you're dishonoring God. And I remember I, passed, I candidated a church to be the pastor. This is like 25 years ago. Went through the candidating process. This was in the Midwest somewhere. And I went through a couple interviews and then they said they, they wanted me to be their pastor. And there was one more step and I had to be interviewed by the elders and they asked me my view of divorce. And they said, oh, that's in conflict with our view of divorce. And they told me their view, view of divorce was you could never become an elder of their church if you've ever been divorced. I said, wow. Could you, be a, could you be a murderer in the past and then get saved and be an elder? They didn't say anything. Because that was Paul, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul couldn't be an elder in your church. He was a murderer and then he got saved. And they said, well, yeah, we were kind of harsh. We kinda, we've mellowed out over the years because we used to not let anybody who ever got divorced become members of our church. And that's when I went, click. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> That was not a church of grace. So we'll talk more about uh, some of these other pressing issues we've got to deal with today and develop a fully informed Christian worldview on some very controversial topics like what is your, what do you think the biblical Christian worldview is on homosexuality, on the roles of husband and wife? I mean, we just go on and on. Uh, your view, your, what do you think the biblical worldview is on how the church relates to government? That's what we're facing today. So before we close, anybody got any questions? As we'll close it up. Thanks for your participation. Leo's got a question. Take it away. Uh, I will give you to that to you after I pray. Yep. Good question. Anybody else? So, Lord willing, we'll we'll see you next Wednesday, seven o'clock. Thanks to David for sound and video. <laughs> Thanks to Sherry for the goodies. <laughs> Let's go ahead. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for this evening and just the privilege to study your word together. Again, thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. And just to talk about the most important things, but yet very fundamental. What is truth? What is the gospel? How can we have faith? And we thank you that you answer all of these very clearly in your word. Uh, we pray that you go before us as we depart and allow everyone to get home safely and have a blessed week. And we commit all things to you in Christ's name. Amen.